<laughs> so on today's episode, we're going to talk about, uh, well, actually, you and I did a live stream with World of Warships mm -hmm. in May, mm -hmm. where we discussed museum ships. The um, actual live stream was interesting because the questions, they changed the questions on us like a few minutes before we actually went on. So we didn't get to talk as a group. We also, uh, it was Ryan, myself, and Drakinafel. Um, we didn't get to do a whole lot of talking on some of the points that we actually had discussed beforehand. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the that, things... There just wasn't enough time anyway. Yeah, they, they, we, we talked initially for like 90 minutes and then they cut <laughs> us down to like 60 or less than less than that. So We were always only supposed to have an hour and we put the three of us in a yeah. room and we can't even say hello in that much time. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we're going to talk about um, museum ships and their types and what makes a particular type of museum ship maybe better than another or maybe less. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're, we're going to discuss that. It's not, not necessarily, it could be, you know, location is king, but maybe the actual ship itself and not really. So the type more so than the history. So we're, we're going to, we're going to get into that. Um, so stay tuned, look forward to that and we'll be right back. Okay, um, so welcome back. Uh, we're going to talk about museum ships and their types in just a second. Um, I do have a little bit of channel admin uh, to go through before we dive into this. So today, July 7th, which is a Thursday, um, as this episode is airing, this kicks off um, weekly content on this channel. Um, so if you like this podcast, if you like ryan's videos if you like drac nfl's videos we're going to be unveiling a um over the next six months we're going to be unveiling um a couple new series on this channel and there will be a video every single week from now going forward and those videos will be posted every thursday so if you would uh, comment on this video like it subscribe do whatever you need to do all the normal youtuber stuff um that would be much much appreciated um you know Ryan and I both have full-time jobs and, you know, this is just kind of a thing on the side. So did you know July 7th is my anniversary? I will have spent 17 years working on museum ships. Oh, well, congratulations. Started when I was 16. So I've been doing it more than half my life now. That's awesome. Congratulations, Ryan. That's why you picked the date, right? Yeah, sure. That's exactly why I picked the date. <laughs> no. Okay. Anyway. Um, so museum ships and their types. Um, for those of, who don't know, Ryan, um, what is your second job? Well, which one are we considering my first job? The New Jersey gig. Okay. Uh, I am the executive director of the Historic Naval Ships Association, which is an organization that represents the historic warship museums around the world. So Ryan is obviously a battleship fanboy. Maybe. A Just a little bit. Okay. I'll grow out of it. But... Because you represent this larger organization, you also have to think with your carrier, your sub, your destroyer, your cruiser hats. Um, so you kind of have to, you know, play ball with them all, right? And, and much like naval combat is a game of rock, paper, scissors, which ones are good as museum ships? That They all have certain benefits and certain downsides. The, the perfect museum ship was never preserved. Is that a specific ship you have in mind or is that just a joke? <laughs> well... A little bit of both. <laughs> Do you want me to tell you what I think the perfect type of museum ship would sure, be? Sure, yeah. Um, we're not going to bury it till the end of the episode. I think that a uh, battle carrier, a, a battleship with a hangar and flight deck on the fantail, I hate that type of warship, but I think that would have made the perfect type of museum ship. So you get the all the internal intricacies and sophistication of an armored ship, a warship like a, like a battleship. So guns and armor and everything else. Mm -hmm. You get the flight deck space, small, albeit small, mm -hmm. of a carrier, um, which and you could display planes on. Exactly. And perhaps more importantly, you get the hangar deck space, which is a ready-made enclosed event space. So all weather regardless of if you put this ship in Buffalo or Galveston, like, um, 
you've seen obviously the the pictures of the proposed New Jersey refit with the third turret removed and the hangar and everything else like that. Ugliest sin. Mm-hmm. You and I are both really happy that that never happened. But under in museum ship that that in your mind could potentially be the best the best museum ship it would have made a better museum ship absolutely um nowadays we have a an awning structure enclosed on all sides on the fantail it's a temporary structure because in new jersey we get snow so that they can't hold a snow load Uh, so we're actually looking at replacing with a permanent structure which means taking the artifact the ship and modifying it in a way the Navy never intended by enclosing a large part of the flight deck in the fantail. And if the Navy had done that on their own, uh, one, we wouldn't be damaging the artifact, and two, we'd have a, a, a tremendous source of revenue in this enclosed event space. Mm-hmm. Now, we're going to touch upon damaging the artifact. Um, so... But we're going to come back to that. Uh, there's something that we're going to circle back to here in a second. Um, between now and the last time we got together, mm-hmm. you went on two trips. Mm-hmm. You went to California to see Hornet. And you most recently took like a northern trip uh, to see um, you went to Buffalo mm-hmm. and a few other places. Um, where, where, where did you go? Uh, so we were. In the area in Rochester, New York, uh, for a convention of tour bus companies, we want to start getting them coming down to the ship more. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that was the impetus for the trip. Now, it's really hard to get funding to go on this trip. I'm a museum curator. Why why am I going to uh, Rochester? So uh, we, we always like to tie our trips into other stuff. So we had to be there for three days for this convention. Um. But it's only a couple hours away from Buffalo, which uh, some of the closest museum ships to me that I'd never visited. They've got the light cruiser uh, modified into a guided missile cruiser, Little Rock. They've got the destroyer USS the Sullivans, and they've got the submarine Croker. Uh, So all ships I haven't been on that that have great histories and uh, really interesting preservation stories as well. And then since we were up there, uh, we wanted to hop over to Cod, and I tried to line everything up so that we could hit cod on her 80th birthday Mm -hmm. which uh, by the time this video airs will have already passed it's uh i think this week in june okay and uh but between the tour bus convention and that being fixed dates there there was no way to make it work uh so we drove over and saw our good friends there and uh cod is renowned in the museum ship world as being one of the best uh restored museum ships period and so I wanted to see what that entailed. And uh, honestly, it wasn't anything special. And I don't mean that in a negative way to the work that they're doing. There there were still pieces of equipment missing. And, and uh, our friends, Paul and Evan, mm-hmm. and the other volunteers, they were telling us about things that they've been trying to acquire for years and they still don't have. It, it, she's not special because she's complete. Uh, she's special because they've done the things that all of our museum ships could have done and just haven't. They, they've done it better. So the the boat had a crew of about 90 during World War II, and so they have 90 towels hanging in various places around the boat where people live. And we could very easily do that. They, they have blankets and pillows on every bed as if the crew just walked off. On a submarine, you can get away with that because there's 90 crew members. And a captain has his little mm-hmm. cabin and, you know, uh, some of the offers, officers do. Um, you can't do that on a battleship. And that's exactly what balances submarines as amazing museum ships mm-hmm. compared to battleships. Uh, one, you don't need nearly as much funding to restore it, to dry dock it, to, mm-hmm. to maintain it, to heat and air condition it. Uh, so you don't need the same level of visitation, which is great because you're never going to cram as many bodies through as you could through a, a capital ship. Mm-hmm. Uh, but two, it is attainable to fully restore it. And I would say that also holds true for uh, destroyers. USS Kidd in Baton Rouge, USS Slater in Albany, where the Hinsa Convention will be this year, mm-hmm. uh, are both 
excellent examples of uh, museum ships alongside Cod and uh, Cobia, another Great Lakes submarine up in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. They've all been really, really well preserved um, because they have a much more finite amount of space, but they do a better job of telling visitors the story of what it was like to live on those ships. Is it just because the ship is physically smaller? So you can, you can instead of look, taking this sort of macro approach, you can boil it down to a micro and, and focus on the bits and pieces and the nuts and bolts. Um, and just because you have less to restore, you can put more time and energy into that artifact. I think that is the largest part of it, but mm -hmm. there's also a small amount that is, um, because it is, I'm not sure they would agree with me when I say this, but because it is a smaller vessel and therefore a, a smaller uh, restoration cost, they can get by more on self-guided visitation mm -hmm. and less on uh, doing all of the like showboat extra things mm -hmm. that, that some of our museums have to do that uh, don't necessarily fit our mission. So Battleship New Jersey had a beer fest last weekend. Mm -hmm. but our, our mission is to educate the public and preserve the ship. Mm -hmm. how, how is having a, a beer fest with a thousand drunks on the fan tail doing that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's making the money that's then allowing us to, to fulfill our mission, to reach out to schools and give them cheap, affordable tours and to, uh, uh, and, and to preserve the ship. Well, as a, as a larger ship, it's almost, you're almost obligated to do events like that because you, you're not a carrier. Obviously we, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in just a second, but you do have that fan tail space. You do have the tent, you know, whether it's a tent or it's enclosed or what have you. Um, so you almost feel like you need to do it. Oh, and you have that brand new deck, which <laughs> looks like uh, like a country club. Makes a great dance floor. You just kind of just want to like lay out on it, put, <laughs> put your towel out in the sun, you know, on the Delaware River. Um, it, it is a wonderful deck. Um, uh, how much left is um, are, you, are, you, are they two turret one now or still or working their way? We're, we're working on the bow. The bow is 12,000 square feet, which is about mm -hmm. a quarter of the total project area. Mm -hmm. um, we've got probably about 35% of the project left to go. And it's a $5 million project. I, it's well, it's, it's gorgeous though. It, oh, it, it looks so good. Um, but therein lies sort of what we're talking about, you know, um, a battleship requiring a full new teak deck, you know, millions of dollars and years worth of time and planning and execution. Yep. Um, if you're a smaller ship, you don't have to deal with that. Maybe you, you have your, there's no wood at all. Mm -hmm. Sometimes but submarines have a little bit of wood yeah. deck, but it, it's slatted. The water doesn't sit on it and rot mm -hmm. it in the same way. And, and I've helped uh, restore the wood deck on the submarine tourist. So, I can say that it is not an easy job to do it or a cheap job, but it certainly doesn't cost $5 million and take five years. Right. Exactly. So, so submarines, so, so some of the smaller museum ships are, so you've talked about the pros of them. Mm -hmm. um, so let's talk about, obviously we just talked about some of the pros of the larger ships. Mm -hmm. um, so what about the aircraft carriers? So as a, non-museum ship person mm -hmm. i don't work in museum ships to me um all museum ship aircraft carriers because it's what a couple intrepids or i'm sorry it's intrepid yorktown lexington hornet and midway mm -hmm. Am I, i'm not missing nope right okay um Cabot wasn't saved so it's a bunch of x6 class carriers and the one midway mm -hmm. um and to me each ship has its own history, obviously, um, but they're all, in my opinion, presented about the same way. So they've all become um, floating air and space museums mm -hmm. because the Essex class, of course, has the World War II period, you know, the 50s, you know, Vietnam, mm -hmm. you know, and then space race. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they're just they're slowly decommissioned and that's it. Um and then, of course, Midway serves much later on. Um, then eventually, obviously, is decommissioned and turned into a museum ship in um, San Diego. Um, so all the carriers, at least in my viewpoint, are presented in sort of the same way because they all serve relatively have the same career. 
they're you know they all have relatively the same story plus or minus a few things and so um the one thing i've noticed is that the experience on them is pretty much identical versus i go to new jersey and the experience is different than if you go to wisconsin Hmm. so i can drive two hours south and get to wisconsin i drive three hours north and get to new jersey so i have two iowa class battleships in driving range, but the experience on both ships is, is different. And again, Wisconsin is obviously a part of a, a larger maritime museum and is the newest and mm-hmm. um, things like that. And so, th- so there's differences there. Um, but with a battleship or a, a gun platform, so like a, a ship that's not a carrier, let's <laughs> just, just go with yeah. that. Um, the way the ship is presented is I think always going to be different um, than the carriers that the carrier's main focus is the air is the airplanes. Mm -hmm. It's their main strike weapon. Other than that, it's a hull with a, with a flight deck, with a hangar deck and a flight deck. Um, And that's not, that's not to say that carriers don't have their place and the people on board them aren't doing a good job. It's quite the opposite. Um, It's just that to me, um, I've always found carrier museum ships a little on the boring side. No, 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 hold on. For a little bit of context, I live like 10 minutes away from the Air and Space Museum mm-hmm. at Dulles Airport in Northern Virginia, the Udvar Hazy Center. Um, no aircraft carrier is ever going to have the space to compete with that. What a magnificent museum. So, you know, I've got a space shuttle. I've got Concorde. I've got everything from F-18s, F-35s, um, you know, um, the Syrian float planes that the I-400 carried. They have the only one of those left in the world. Um, and there's a lot of aircraft in that museum that are a one of mm-hmm. one in the world. So I've been going through that museum since before it opened in 2000. It was opened, I believe, in 2004. I've been, I, I first went in the fall of 20. Uh, Mm Oh, three. So this marks 20, 20 years. (laughs) So my viewpoint is skewed. So I'm not even counting my opinion as, as being valid. It's just, so that has kind of ruined me on carriers. I think the plus side is, is that with all those carriers, so, you know, the two on the West coast, the two on the East coast, and then the one sort of in the Gulf coast, if they're presented as these sort of time capsules between the forties and the sixties, and they get a little bit of air and space in there, I think they're perfect destination for families. Mm-hmm. So the people who can't make it to DC can't do this, or maybe don't have an air and space museum or a, or a good air museum where they are. So it bridges this gap. And if you take your family to uh, the air and space museum here, your four year old is never going to make it through the whole museum. They'll be wowed. They'll be impressed. Mm-hmm. But you, the parent will never get to see everything in one trip. No, you get run over. I mean, the, if you've ever been to DC, to the one down there it's it's well it's been under construction for a number of years now so half of it's closed and then um you can't even see anything because normally you get run over by people um the, the experience at udvar hazi the second one is um if you're looking for just the artifacts and the planes that's a much better experience i find that the one in the air and space museum in dc is a like they have some really interesting artifacts too don't get me wrong but that's like a concepts of, of flight. It's more technical and more yeah. STEM than anything yeah. else. Um, so, so given given what I just said about aircraft carriers, what's the what's the museum ship experts take? You know, aircraft carriers are a finite space, which again better for a uh, a better better for a family to be able to go through it in one day than than to somewhere huge like uh, the this air and space museum here in DC. Um, and there, there's a wow factor with aircraft carriers. The wow factor in aircraft carriers, you get on that flight deck and you're like, oh my God, look at all of this space. We built something this big that can move. Mm-hmm. And uh, that, that is certainly impressive. But it's also impressive and, and I would argue perhaps more impressive when you go on the bow of a battleship and you look forward, you've got this towering superstructure mm-hmm. and those guns right there. And that, that's the big selling point of the battleship over the aircraft carriers, those guns. You, you, you hit the nail on the head here because every time I get on a battleship museum, um, you always have to walk to the bow, turn around and snap that picture. Yeah. I have um, 
when we were at Hinsa in 21 mm-hmm. in Mobile mm-hmm. on uh, Alabama, um, when we were having the luau in the last night, I just I the sun was setting and I like bolted to the front and I, I'll dig this picture out, but the sunset and that, that, that shot is just, it's, it's wonderful. And um, of course I have it on New Jersey every time I go and it's, <laughs> it, it, the picture never changes, but it's, you know, maybe, Hey, with the new deck, you know, it'll yeah. look, that picture will look, you, you won't have to crop out the bottom you half of it to crop out, out of embarrassment, <laughs> <laughs> you know, as the moss sort of overtakes the, uh, <laughs> overtakes the picture. Um, no, it's, it'll, it'll, it'll be our okay. botanical garden. Hey, you know, it'll, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. You know, she's just getting a makeup job. It'll be fine. Um, but I think that's really the, the, the selling point. I think you walk up to a battleship and it looks like a ship. Yes. You know? it, um, it's, it's just, an, it yeah. looks like a warship. Yeah. It's warship. Impressive. Exactly. Those lines. And, yeah. Yeah. And, um, and you can see, and you can see from every element that this is a, like you said, a, a warship between the main guns, the secondary battery, missile launchers. Of course, you know, they were all refit, you know, and just everything is there for a purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, you know, for carriers, their main purpose is to launch aircraft. So their defining feature is the fact that it's long and flat on top. Which um, makes them a great event space. And it mm-hmm. makes it a great space for uh, families, older people, your average guest to navigate. There's a lot less stepping over really high watertight doors and mm-hmm. through these really thick armored decks with really big steps. That's another thing. I've been to Midway mm-hmm. three times now. Mm-hmm. And I've only ever been in the main hangar, the flight deck, um, the event space that... Um, the Western Naval History Association uses for their conference, which is the reason why I've been to Midway three times. Um, and like the, uh, and just a few other sort of rooms off that, that like are on like, so sort of the main tour right mm-hmm. off the, the hangar. Um, th- these are gigantic ships, especially Midway. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and most of that ship is pretty much closed off because why, why, why have families, lost to the world you know lost in one of the thousands of rooms um and and i get that too because once you get past the hangar Mm -hmm. except for maybe the machinery which for u.s warships is kind of cut and paste by by 45 it's a little bit more subdivided than most other Mm -hmm. u.s warships which makes for a a, a more difficult tour experience you Mm -hmm. can't fit as many guests in the same space they do have a great engine room tour mm-hmm. and did, did you get to do that while you were there See, that's the thing i i have yet to do that oh you really missed out that, that is mm-hmm. a, a great part of that ship's tour and i and i would like to but so maybe aside from that there really isn't a whole lot there whereas i've been i've been from basically bilge to top on alabama i've been from bilge to really top on new jersey never let never let Ryan take you on a tour because you say you want to see something and he ends up taking you to places that you physically just feel sick going. <laughs> <laughs> he will find the smallest, most claustrophobic space he can possibly find and stuff you into it. I didn't design the ship. It's not my fault. Um, it's so, okay. So, uh, so yeah. So in terms of tours, the battleships to me have always been the most appealing because when you go from sort of bottom to top, um, the machinery is always interesting. You have various armored decks that mm-hmm. you pass through. Um, you have obviously the main internal armor belt that you can see in spaces. You have main battery magazines, secondary battery magazines, you know, anti-aircraft battery magazines. Um, you have bar- the turret barbettes. Mm-hmm. I always find are very interesting, yeah. and and then you have that wonderful turret two tour, you know, and you can see the where the, the powder bags come through and the elevators, and it's just it's just really really gorgeous, and all that machinery, and it's just it just is really appealing to me. And as someone who is there to see a warship, that's what resonates, um, which is again why I'm sort of not that fond of carrier museums. Um, what's your experience? Uh, within a year of each other, I 
managed to make it on the last of the eight American battleships and mm-hmm. the last of the five carriers that are preserved as museums. Mm-hmm. How was Hornet, by the way? I would say that, uh, like you were saying, the aircraft carriers fit on a very small spectrum of air and space museum to preserving a ship in a traditional fashion, mm-hmm. where Intrepid is all the way air and space museum on the spectrum. Hornet is all the way uh, preserved as a ship on the spectrum. I'd say she is the most intact mm-hmm. of all of them, with uh, Midway, Yorktown, and Lexington being more perfectly in the middle of parts of them have been restored like a ship, parts of them have been uh, turned into an air and space museum or, or a more traditional museum experience. Um, so that that kind of brings me to the to the final point, and we're going to discuss this. And you, you've already you've already touched on it, and I wanted to save this, and I have a couple examples. First time we got okay, we're good. Um, is museum ships in the future? Is preserving the ship as an artifact more important than making the ship accessible? for its visitors so two examples one you talked about modifying the the flight deck the stern area on new Mm -hmm. jersey to put this sort of permanent enclosure to me that's not that big of a deal at the end of the day you're welding some stuff onto some steel that has already been chopped grinded welded about a million times in in her career and all you're doing is putting a little cap on the stern right is that That, what we're, we're getting at and that's the key to me it is an entirely reversible change we we cut we remove the sides we cut the four pillars and the flight deck is back the way it is. Mm-hmm. However, it will alter the silhouette of the ship for every guest who comes out, takes pictures, those sorts of things. And uh, we probably have the best setup with our pier of the various battleships to be able to take a nice broadside picture. Mm-hmm. Another example that I have is Yorktown. Mm-hmm. And some of the ex- other exit class carriers are like this as well. Well, it was no for me. It was most noticeable as you're walking down that really long pier that goes mm-hmm. out to Yorktown at Patriots Point. Um, the first time I ever visited that, all of a sudden here's this like tumor looking growth on the side of the ship, this big rectangular metal box that's at this angle. It's an escalator, mm-hmm. and not only that, but it doesn't work. Uh, (laughs) so obviously installed at some point or at least theirs that doesn't work um but you know it was for getting back so once you once you take the tour up to the flight deck go through the conning tower it's for getting back down technically you go back up but how they have it routed you go back down it Mm -hmm. back into the flight deck so it's this escalator that takes you from sort of the conning tower and instead of going through a small ladder way or a hatch or something like that, it takes you physically outside the ship, brings you down back into the hangar. And so to me, that is you cut two big holes in the side of the ship. Maybe one hole existed already, depending on how things were set up. Um, and then you have this escalator that's in cl- encased in metal um, baking in the Carolina sun. <laughs> so it was quite hot. But um so that that's an example of modifying the artifact permanently to better suit the um, uh, you know the, the tours and the and the visitors. Um, I want to get your take on the what's going to happen on USS Iowa. Um, for those that maybe don't know, Iowa is going to be the center point of the new U.S. Surface Navy Museum. Um, in, uh, and that will open sometime in 2025. Um, it really is going to be spectacular. They've done a, a wonderful job at sort of designing this. However, um, one of the things that's going to happen is to make Iowa more accessible, um, we were shown a drawing or rendering of basically a big hole going to be cut in the side of the ship and a permanent walkway is going to be installed so that instead of having to walk up onto the deck and then down various ladders and stuff like that, you can then just access right into the ship. And not only are they cutting a hole in the side of the ship, but the compartments that that hole leads to are going to be not just gutted of like bunks and turned into exhibit spaces, 
but the actual compartments themselves are going to be physically altered to make them bigger, easier to you know maneuver through and around so that the museum spaces, this was basically going to be like Battleship on the outside, Epcot on the inside as sort of like the larger area is more like going to be New Disney World. Um, what is your take on that? Because when I heard that, I, I'm, you know, you can call me a purist, but <laughs> I'm okay with, you know, welding your, your cap on the, on the stern of New Jersey. But if, if you were to take a torch to the, to the side of that ship, there would have to organize a riot or something. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm really torn on it. And until I see the work they do, I'm going to try and reserve uh, judgment. And I, I, I know, given in this way, I, I, I told you to say what your other job was, because as <laughs> director of Hinsa, you kind of have to be careful. Um, and I get that. Um, and I, I'm not expecting. Um, but as just for, for, to me, it's just it seems like a mistake. Um, but if something like that is required to make museum ships more accessible and increase visitation um, and keep ships around longer. Is that viable? Do you, do you think that is uh, acceptable? It is possible to maintain museum ships long term uh, by preserving them as ships and giving people the experience of the crew just walked off. Uh, but it, I do not believe that it would be possible to preserve all of the museum ships in the country that way. So we have to do something different if we want to save all of our ships. And we want to save all of our ships. Mm -hmm. They each, all the ones that, that have made it this far have really special and unique stories. They're all um, in different markets. Like we want access to this maritime cultural heritage mm -hmm. to be as accessible to as many people as possible. Uh, and that means having many ships all over the country uh, and the world, hopefully other countries uh, start preserving more ships like the United States do, uh, does. Sure. The United States do or does. Uh, but <laughs> um, so we, we have to change things. I will not be the first one to cut a hole in the side of their ship. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, submarines have done that for years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, HMS Victory, mm -hmm. you're entering through through a hole in the gun deck. There's mm -hmm. many ships that have done that. They um, won't be the first ones to remove like sections of watertight doors and bulkheads mm -hmm. to make them more ADA compliant. Alabama, mm -hmm. uh, mentioned earlier, has that. And uh, I, I'm extremely pro-accessibility. Like mm -hmm. I said, the more people that are able to experience their maritime cultural heritage, the better. So as long as it's done correctly <laughs> and in good taste and with and ultimately if the artifact is still sort of the centerpiece and we're not gutting a ship to turn it into a casino <laughs> or, or a restaurant <laughs> or something silly, um, does that so that that makes it OK? Uh, because I, I would I would agree with that. At and the end of the day, potentially, uh, uh, we have four Iowa class battleships that are preserved. Sure. So if you cut a hole in one, maybe you don't cut a hole in the other. And now you're, you know, your average is still pretty good. Yeah. 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 Uh, that's in this case, I'm not too disheartened by it because there are three other ones that are all in various conditions of uh, fully intact. Mm -hmm. uh, or able to be returned to intactness. Like you mentioned, we mm -hmm. cut a hole in our bar bat uh, to let people into the turret for that mm -hmm. tour. Obviously, we've just done what we talked about not liking and made the ship mm -hmm. not intact anymore. But you, but right next to said hole is the piece of steel. Like, so it's, and as you described, it can be slid back in and welded back maybe it's not exactly the same as if like you had the original cast piece but you can make it whole if versus if, just starting to grind cut stuff away and it goes in the recycling bin and you know yeah if for some reason we ever shut down that tour the mm -hmm. last day of tours uh once the last group leaves we weld that back in place and the ship is intact again and, and you get to experience the ship in a, yeah. a more complete stage mm -hmm. um but in the meantime, you can only access the turrets via vertical ladders. 
-hmm. So even though more people can do a vertical ladder than can't, it's still somewhat mm -hmm. accessible. It's dangerous, no matter who you are, especially the, the heights associated with turret two. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, th there is definitely an amount of modifications that you have to make, whether you want an intact ship or not. Absolutely. Um, because it still has to be appealing to for the public who at this day and age on other museums is used to a certain there's yeah. there's, there's you know uh, you know you go to a, a land based museum <laughs> and you're used to certain things being the way they are and certain levels of accessibility and other things like that you take your family to a museum ship and suddenly that all goes out the window people might not be ready to make those concessions yeah, our mission of uh, preserving the ship and educating the public is sometimes at odds. Just to preserve the ship perfectly would be to not let the public on board. At all. <laughs> they, they consume the artifact. Simply walking on the deck will damage the tile or, or mm -hmm. wear away the paint. Uh, or by cutting these holes to make it more accessible, you're, Fair enough. you're making holes in the ship. But then why would you preserve the ship if you can't educate the public mm -hmm. by allowing them through? So there is a balance, mm -hmm. and uh, we're still maintaining ships as museums is very new in the history of, of the world. Mm -hmm. So we're still trying to find that give take of where the the good balance is. Mm -hmm. All right. So let us know in the comments below what your thoughts are on this matter. Should museum ships be preserved thoroughly as ships? Are you okay with the artifacts being modified for better accessibility. Uh, but we're going to cut this here because you and I could keep going for hours. <laughs> and I'm really trying to keep these a little shorter than they were last time. <laughs> so, 40 minutes. There you go. All right. So we're going to end there. Um, as always, Ryan, thank you very much. Um, I'm Jack Russell with the United States Naval Institute. And of course, Ryan needs no introduction. Um, and we'll see you again on the next one. Thanks.